this. I hope everything's working. Um, so please drop us a line in the comments and tell us where you are in the world. Tell us your name and come and tell us a bit about how you found the course, because obviously this live stream today is for the free mini botanical formulation course that we've been running over the last three weeks. And I can tell you that we have almost seven and a half thousand students on this mini course at the moment. So it's completely free. You can still sign up for it. Everything's still there. But obviously this is the last tutor session where you can speak to us directly. I've just realized I've forgotten to plug in my headphones. So I'll do that in a minute. That's <laughs> so okay. my name is Lorraine. I'm the CEO of Formula Botanica. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself to me while I plug yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you again. Uh, three weeks in a row. My name is Timmy. I'm the head of formulation and research at Formula Botanica. And yeah, this is exciting. We we reached the third week. Um, judging by the comments and the amount of students we have for this free course, um, you've done so well. So we expect that you are on the final module and we hope you've enjoyed it because yeah i mean some great products we've seen on our social media right i mean instagram was just like Phew. i know yeah. <laughs> we've loved it so week one we did cleansers by face cleansers think. week two we did organic toners Mm -hmm. And obviously week three, which is the week we're on right now, the final week, we've been doing organic oil based serums. So that's what we're here to talk to you about today, which is super exciting. Okay. But I thought before we start answering your questions, because there are a load of questions, I'm looking at them here, I can see them all already. Um, before we start going through them, first of all, I thought maybe we could talk about what a serum is. So why don't uh why don't you start with that timmy why don't you tell us a bit about what a serum is and why we've chosen an oil-based serum okay so basically a serum is well very simply put um is a concentrated moisturizer that is packed with high performance ingredients that's the the simple version now um the the reason is that you know these the serums are they can be used as a moisturizer as well but their function is more as i said to deliver those really potent high performance actives into the skin um that they, and this is where they make a huge difference so this is where the difference is between a serum and a, a normal facial oil yeah um so it's not just for moisturizing but also when you really want an impact whatever the reason you use a serum for Brilliant. So yeah, there are many versions and in this course we included the oil serum, yeah. which I think is one of the easiest to start with. Well, depending on how you look at it, but the, I think it, it's great, especially if you guys are beginner formulators, because first of all, you don't need to worry about preserve, preservatives, preservation. You don't need to worry about checking the pH. You don't need to worry about... Um, um, viscosity consistency because you know let's just say you create a gel it might separate it might an emotion can be very different as well yeah. we'll look at that so there are some examples for you so oil-based serums are, are one of the, the, the first things you could learn is especially if you want to work towards an anti-aging product they are relatively simple to make while you've seen it in the course um, but I think the complicated part, look at that, mm -hmm. that, that color is just stunning, um, is really, I think this is one um, product where it's important that you, you understand your ingredients and you really, <laughs> you just can't stop. <laughs> I feel like one of these hand models and <laughs> just dropping oils. <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually showcasing some of our graduates while Timmy is talking because you can't see this, but my desk in front of me, in front of the computer, is covered in bottles at the moment because I have so many oil serums from our graduates. So I just showed you the first one was uh, Pomoja, which is our graduate Sarah in the UK, and she's created this Restore Multi Purpose Beauty Oil Serum, which contains Kahai oil, which I've never used. Do you know that one, Timmy? I think I have, I have, but I haven't used it. I tend to just buy stuff and then <laughs> I eventually I'm going to get there. And then we have uh, Native Essentials I just showed you as well. So this is Daniela, our mm -hmm. graduate, and she's based in both Hong Kong and Bangkok. So she's over in, in um, 
Asia, and this is one of her many serums. I've got another one. Of I her think many. I think in, in general at Formula Botanica, we just love colorful full stuff, so colorful mm -hmm. serums, colorful balms. Like, look at that. Yeah. What does this one have? This what? one is Rosehip and Sea Buckthorn. This is uh, by Emma from the Sunday uh, Standard, who's one of our graduates in uh, Illinois, USA. So yeah, lots. I'll have more. I'll hold them up while Timmy is talking and answering some. <laughs> yeah, like I got distracted. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, there are different types of serums, um, and you've already touched on this a little bit. But we've got, you know, we've covered this in one of our blog posts as well, actually. So hopefully, one of our team members can put up. I think it's the five different types yeah. of serums that there are. But as Timmy said, we started you with oil based because you don't have to preserve anything and you get to work with these amazing oils, which is so inspirational. And I hope you had lots of fun while you were going through the course, experimenting with the oils that you might already have had and maybe some new ones that you bought as well. Yeah, that's the thing with with this kind of product. That's why I like it. And, and I always work with with serums or work on serums because there's just so many choices. You have, I mean, um, I was just showing Lorraine beforehand, but I'll show you guys as well. I've got some new oils some time ago and I'm in love with these. So this is coriander seed oil. You may have heard of coriander seed essential oil, which is just as nice. Ooh, I thought I can't open it. <laughs> but this has um, slightly green um, color and it's it's got a very delicate scent. And it's lovely and light you can't really see it but it's not a rich oil yeah but like for example this could be oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so nice it's seriously so nice so you have so many variations now on the market where you can really create a, an oil based serum that stands out then i've got parsley seed oil and i've got green coffee oil so as i said just experiment and you know the minute you have a chance to purchase some oils or even just get a small amount like 20 grams or 20 meals just get it and see how they work because you can do so many different things i'm such a weakling i was trying to open the bottle <laughs> what 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 oil is that that is prickly pear seed oil which oh, is actually wonderful. one of my favorites i mean it's very expensive but oh my goodness it's amazing you have to try it um so we're here yeah. to teach you today, so I guess rather than show us our amazing stash, um, we should answer some of your questions. So let me dive straight in. And one thing that I've seen come back in a lot of the questions, and we should address this straight away, is CO2 extracts. Because obviously the sample formulation we gave you in the course contains CO2 extracts. And quite a few people, like we've got a question here from uh, Bichitra in, well, I don't know where she is actually, saying, um, if I can't get sea buckthorn CO2 extract, can I use sea buckthorn oil? Should it also be used at the same percentage? Will it be as potent? So let's start with that one. Okay, so I would say, and probably there will be some people who will disagree with me, but way I approach CO2 extracts is that they are, as the name says, they are extract. Yeah. And the way they are extracted, they are using, as the name suggests, CO2 gas. Now, I've been I've been reading a lot about them because they are not that new, but they are still relatively new. So there are some studies out there regarding potency. Um, but I, I also think it's important that you understand that when it comes to CO2 extracts, you need to get the paperwork to really understand um, how potent CO2 extracts are. Yeah. Now, usually we use CO2 extracts either for some sort of skin benefit um, such as the sea buckthorn CO2, as you mentioned, or we could use the CO2 extract. This one has Love it. one in it. I've been I'm just reading labels here while you're talking to Are you you trying to detect sea buckthorn? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like for example, sea buckthorn for the its skin benefits, but also you could use CO2 extract for their fragrance. Mm -hmm. Now, because because of the extraction method they can be a bit more potent than normal carrier oil so this is the answer to your question Bishitra that you don't you while you can replace it you may not get the same sort of results um, when you change an extract to an oil so if you exchange the two they are not that exchangeable but again you need the paperwork to really understand the breakdown and um, what is in the CO2 extract. 
When it comes to usage, again, there are lots of conflicting informations out there when it comes to CO2 extract, so not the oil. So I'm not talking about the Cibachthorn oil, but the extract. Some places say you should use 3% total. Other places say 6% total. I've read there are some where you could use even 20%. Um, it depends on the plant. So for example, I've read in one of the sources that you could use 20%, maybe lavender CO2 extract. But when it comes to chili CO2, you should not use more than half a percent. So, <laughs> well, chili chocolate, I love it. <laughs> no, but can you imagine applying, well, I mean, for instance, I was sent a serum for the intimate area the other day. <laughs> if this had chili in it, I don't think I'd be sick. Yeah, that that's the thing. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you are using. Um, and also, I mean, my biggest issue always is that there are so many conflicting informations out there. I really think, especially if you're preparing a product for sale, talk to your safety assessor. Yeah. Because even though you might find literature on using, I don't know, um, an extract at 10%, if the safety assessor will not allow you to sell that product, uh, you know, yeah. you, you, you might just want to skip it. And not to mention the price. Yeah. And if you're in a country where safety assessment isn't a thing, so that is very much part of the EU yeah. cosmetics regulations, then work with a consultant who is specializes in things like essential oils or understands um, dermal limits, which is very important. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Timmy is right. They can be very potent. They so can. We've also got a question here from Joelle who asks where she can buy or order CO2 extracts. Now, there is a supplier guide in your course. Obviously, it's not as comprehensive as the one that you get when you enroll with us, but we've still put some of the very, very best suppliers in there. Um, do, you, do you have any that you can recommend to me? Um, I do, actually. Um, one of the places I love to shop at is in Romania, and it's called Elemental.eu. They have some really cool CO2 extracts. When you, when you look at suppliers, you need to look at um, not only um, high performance ingredients, if they have um, groups of ingredients on their website, but you should also look at their fragrance side, um, parts, like where they list essential oils, because often you find CO2 extracts that are used especially for their scent. Um, you've got Aromantic in the UK, where you can go again, they have great selection. But what I also recommend is that you reach out to a supplier in Germany called Flavex. And oh my God, they are one of the nicest people ever. We've, we've met them many times at In Cosmetics and they are more than happy to send you samples. So you will find on their website a huge list of CO2 extracts. Um, you, they are they always very fast to respond to you and you get i don't know i'm not even sure two five grams of co2 extracts as samples wow. so yeah reach out to them because they are really cool not to mention when when i met them at in cosmetics we we were chatting about sourcing and how difficult it is to, for for indie brands or even someone who is just creates products for themselves to source good co2 extracts that are not diluted and they are really in raw form and they have, as far as I know, it's still on, they have a 100 euro order limit. So it's still achievable. It's not, a huge, you don't have to buy 25 kilos. <laughs> so it's still something that is, you know, especially if you buy five, six different CO2s. Yeah. I can easily reach 100 euros. <laughs> What is <laughs> formulation expert but you you love formulating and that's what we want to really instill in you that you you come out of this mini course thinking wow i love formulating i want to do more of this i want to experiment with different ingredients and once we come out of lockdown and once these trade shows are back on and they are held all over the world there is no excuse anyone can reach one you can go to go to something like in cosmetics and go and stand at these stalls and try all these different co2 extracts and they are incredible as timmy yeah. said and when we visited uh, flavex at in cosmetics in paris last year it was in paris yeah suddenly like, when was that <laughs> they had this stall that was covered with samples didn't they and they had all of the different flavors and scents out there and you could just pick them up and 
test them and smell them. I will try to find the pictures. We took some really cool photos so I could just upload. So you see that there's a huge amount of CO2 extracts that they supply and some of them are really exciting. Yeah. So yeah, um, another one, actually, sorry, just one more is um, Hermitage. Am I pronouncing it properly? Yes, Hermitage, Hermitage oil. Oils. They moved to Italy um, two years ago because of Brexit, as so they were in the UK before, but the the euro pound exchange rate wasn't so favorable anymore so they moved there but they have a huge array as well don't they yeah they i think they tend to deal with more with fragrance um as in aromatic co2 extracts but still it's worth checking that out because um they are in europe so if you are in europe that's a good place to go awesome Right, let's move on. So uh, Temi Tope says, thank you so much. I've enjoyed every bit of the course. I will try to practice with the little resources available. Good luck. We really hope that you enjoy these materials. So that's why we put them out there. You know, we want you to, to use some of our best ever beginner materials to get started. So I really hope you've enjoyed it. And Caroline says, hi, awesome intro to your courses. I wasn't able to do much formulating because I didn't order supplies far enough in advance. The course will still be there for you. I don't have a firm date for when we're taking it down. It will be there for at least another month. So you have lots and lots of opportunities to, to get started still. And the, the materials will still be there for you to use. But she says, I plan on signing up in July for our next term time. So we look forward to welcome you into our community then. Let's see. OK, uh, so we've got uh, a question here from Rogaye. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. I do apologize if I haven't who says, I've got two questions. Firstly, I can't find any CO2 extracts in my country. So what is an alternative? I, I would say depending on what CO2 you are interested in, because you could just use essential oils, mm -hmm. depending on the CO2 extract type, because they, they have different types like select and total and, and so on. Um, the select ones usually are similar, they are similar to essential oils. So that could be a good alternative, or you could just omit them, just leave them out. If you know, they they would make a difference, but then if you can't um, source it, we wouldn't want you to stop just because of that. Um, I think my, sorry, my my list has gone crazy. What was yes. the next question? Is the source, how can I replace it? Uh, no, the next question actually was about preservative eco. So we've had a couple of questions. My um, all of the questions suddenly are disappearing because you're all commenting. <laughs> so oh, we're just okay. going to so it. No, it's fine. Um, so some people have asked about preservative eco. I'll make a note of some of the questions as you're talking, so we don't lose them. So what should people do if they can't get hold of preservative eco? And now we're talking, of course, about the toner and about the um, biphase cleanser from lesson one. Um, yeah, we touched upon this topic last time when we did the live stream um, about the toners and basically what you then need to do, first of all, are you sure you can't get hold of Preservative Eco because as far as we are aware, they are sold in EU, in the US, in um, Asia, in Australia, but they have different trading names. So first of all, check it again using the Inky listing. You will find that in the course and just copy and paste the ink listing in your browser and see. If you still can't find it, then you need to look for an alternative. And it depending on depends on the it depends on the product. You you want to use something that is broad spectrum. Now chances are that you will not find one single preservative that is broad spectrum, as in with one component. The broad broad spectrum preservatives tend to be blends. So as preservative eco, it has four different components. You need to look for something that is broad spectrum. I can't really give you um, an alternative as such, because again, this depends on what you created, what ingredients you used, and um, you know what packaging you use. So it's, it, you, you can't just replace one preservative with another and keep the same percentages and the same usage. So you will need to check your suppliers and read the supplier's recommendation. Yep. OK, I'm making notes of, of all the questions. <laughs> OK, uh, I've got an, another question here. And I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the person who asked it. Uh, but someone asked, uh, can we find organic CO2 extracts as well? Absolutely. You can. 
Yeah, you just again you you um, you need to check what the supplier says, check the paperwork. But yeah, usually you can find the organic version as well as the non-organic version. Obviously, there will be um, price difference, but at least you have a choice. Yes, I would always say um, just on that note that while you're experimenting, don't worry about organic. While you are experimenting, it's all about finding the balance, finding the synergy the skin feel and once you are happy with the formulation switch to organic because if god forbid and it will happen something goes wrong it, something gets ruined you don't want to chuck your good expensive ingredients in the bin um so yeah just go for the non-organic first and once you are happy just switch to the organic cool right okay i'm gonna go down my list i'm writing <laughs> Okay, so someone else asked, can we use infused oils instead of carrier oils when we're making an oil-based serum? Absolutely. It, yeah. it's, it's a great way to include um, botanicals in your, um, in your formulations. And in, in, in a way, infused oils or macerated oils are actually carrier oils because they have the carrier oil base. And then you add the, the plant matter and you just infuse it in the oil base. Again, Kelly, if you're around, we do have an article about how to make oil, oil infusions or macerated oils that you may find useful. But yeah, just go for it. Yes. Use them. Use them as little as one, two, three, five percent or use even 90 percent. They are really, really nice. And you've got, again, lots of choices. Yeah, they're so much fun to bake. We also have a couple of articles about which base oils to choose for infusions. Of course we do. Yeah. And um, let's see what else have we got. We've got an article about. Oh, I can't remember. There's there's about three articles we've got on the site about how to make macerated oils. So we've got one about the different oils, one about oh yeah, the steps to choosing the right oil as well. So what should you choose when what should you keep in mind as you're choosing a base oil? And then there are so many different botanical extracts or plants that you can infuse into an oil. And often it will impart the scent as well. So you can put vanilla pods in an oil so it takes on that vanilla fragrance. I remember when I first got started, I used to dry chamomile flowers in my garden and infuse them and then it would have that lovely chamomile sort of apple fragrance. Very so nice. you can get, yeah, you can get really creative with it. And sometimes it lends color as well, which is really fun. Yeah, no, they are really superb. I think for me, one of the, the best ones were the, the rosemary, um, mm. um, the rosemary um, infused oils. Yeah. Very nice. Again, depends on what you like. I think the most important part here is that you don't use, you only use dry plant matter when you macerate oils. Um, you don't use fresh. So let's just say you want, I don't know, mint from your garden. You can't use um, fresh um, plant matter. For, yeah, because then, then the water will come out of the plant and come into the oil and the oil rancidity will speed up and then you might have quite a a, a nasty smelling oil yeah. after a while so you start walking probably <laughs> <laughs> grow legs exactly so then lots, we won't grow legs <laughs> got lots of lovely comments about the course so we're so pleased that you've enjoyed it uh, seriously this is exactly what we wanted we wanted to lift your spirits and also show you what it's like to study at formula botanica because you know we already have almost 9,000 students and they're all over the world and we get these wonderful reviews, but we know that not everyone obviously has enrolled with us yet. So we wanted to give you the opportunity to try out all of these free materials. So loving the fact that you've had such a good time on the course. Right, okay, next questions. Um, someone asks, can we infuse hyaluronic acid or vitamin C in our oil-based serums? Um, you've got oil so <laughs> oil dispersible vitamin C's. Um, again, you need to check which type you have. So you can't just use ascorbic acid um, for, for this particular, um, um, so for oils rather. Um, and again, hyaluronic acid, again, um, know that's an oil soluble um, compound, sorry, water soluble compound. So that's not going to work in an oil base. Although recently I've seen something um, that is oil soluble hyaluronic acid I think it's an encapsulated um, version. So do your research and check the solubility. Um, and yeah, again, you don't need to infuse it because you're not going to filter it out, but you add it as part of your formulation, yeah. um, depending on the percentage you want. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Go and explore the ingredients that are out there. And if you go to sometimes to trade shows when they're back on or you go to this, the websites of some of these suppliers, they will often showcase a lot of their ingredients and tell you what solubility they have. So when you're making an oil based formulation like this beautiful one by our graduate, uh, I've forgotten her name. Ah, oh, shame on you, Lorraine. Um, so Solo Skin London, who just launched, and she's uh, here in the UK, obviously, and this is her night oil. But when you're making an oil, obviously, you need to make sure that any ingredient you put in there is oil soluble as well. Because if you add water, much like you saw in lesson one, it will separate into two phases. And then you haven't got a serum. You haven't got an oil based serum anymore. I suppose you probably could make a biphase serum. I think so. That's why I love biphase. That's why I said yeah. in the very in the very first lesson mm -hmm. that I think it's very underrated and you could do so many good things with biphase products. It's just not many people choose to do that. Nope. Yeah. It's on usually imagination. On those shelves behind me where we have all the graduate products, or not all of them, but a tiny it's bit. It's collapsing, of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are no biphase products on there. No one makes them or sells them in our community yet. And I still don't know why, because they are so cool you can even do really cool stuff with color as well but um yeah you can as long as you use oil based ingredients in your oil based serum you can really the world is your oyster there are so many different ingredients to choose from um, and as timmy said that the industry is getting very clever at creating different solubilities but sometimes those ingredients are synthetic so yeah. there is an oil based vitamin c that is generally synthetic so you do then need to be aware of what ingredients you're using, whether you actually want to incorporate any synthetic ingredients or not. Obviously, we don't at Formula Botanica because we teach we're an organic formulation school. But if that's something that you're happy with doing, then there's nothing wrong with that. OK, next question. Um, Rita asks, uh, she says, I'm still confused about the difference between extracts and macerated oils. Can you talk a bit more about that one? Um, sure. So basically, um, macerated oils um, it, it's got a carrier oil base. So let's just say um, a general um, starting point would be 10% dried plant and 90% carrier oil. And then as you leave the, the plant in the oil to infuse, either using heat or sunshine, again, there are some discrepancies in, uh, th there are some um, different opinions about which method is the best. Over time, the oil absorbs oil soluble particles from that particular plant matter. So there's the infused oil. Amazing. Yeah. You, you shut your show off. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the extract, which is already a, a ready extracted compound from the plant matter. So, for example, let's just say chamomile. So if you use chamomile, dried plant, infuse it in the oil, let's just say for a month, you get an infused oil, and then you already ha you have the chamomile CO2 extract, which is they are using CO2 and a bit of heat to grab the, the compounds out. So chances are that the extracts tend to be a bit more potent because depending on the extraction method, um, you'd get more, more of these compounds out while with the infusion, it's much more gentle. Still very nice, but probably, you know, you need to treat them differently. So for example, if you create um, um, something, let's just say a lovely oil for your baby or your baby massage, maybe macerated oils are really nice um, place to start. I would not go for extracts for, for those products because they tend to be stronger. Yeah. So I hope that's a bit, you know, that helped a bit. <laughs> Sometimes I don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> um, someone else, before I before I ask the next question, yeah. just what I was using just then was uh, one of our graduates, Stella in Copenhagen, recently launched Naughty Alchemist. So this is one of her serums. It's called like the Moonlight, yeah, Moonlight Renewing Serum. And it contains all sorts of amazing oils like black cumin oil, even primrose, um, hemp seed oil, borage seed oil. Gosh, there's loads of them. Very, very beautiful. So I was just testing that. Um, right, someone else asked, uh, so we just talked about the difference between extracts and maceration. Someone else asked about the difference between floral absolutes and extracts. Um, 
Well, I think they are actually more or less the same thing. But when you say floral extract, you need to check the extraction method. Absolutes tend to be, um, they, they tend to be used in perfumery. And the, the, the thing is that they use alcohol um, to, to create, to, to, to grab the compounds out from the, the plant, from the flowers. And so you've got um, an extract with, with a little bit of alcohol in it still. So it's not always suitable for everyone. Whereas when you say extract, well, what kind of extract? Is it steam distilled? Is it CO2 extract? So there is all sorts of methods to get the extract. Um, you need to check what, what the other extract is. Awesome. But usually absolutes are used for their fragrance. Yes. Right. Okay. Gosh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> yeah, I know there are so many questions coming up. It's like ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I really am. Bear with me. Um, and I've got a long list of notes I'm writing down here to try and remember all your questions just in case they disappear because there's so many coming in that they're just flying up. I will prioritize all the serum-based questions. So I'm seeing lots of questions about emulsions, about cleansers, about toners, about water-based products we'd love to be able to answer them but today's q a really is about serum so if i get to the end of this list and we've exhausted all the serum questions i promise i will come back to you but we are going to have to prioritize all the oil-based ones first right um someone else asked do macerated oils need a preservative <clears throat> you should add either tocopherol so vitamin e or rosemary extract these two are really good uh, for that antioxidant properties because you want to make sure your oil doesn't go rancid um, again just to repeat when you do macerated oils use dried plant matter yeah. um, so you don't need to worry about preservation at all yeah and on that note uh someone else asked ah um, <laughs> Let's see. Do we need to, if uh, this coming back to CO2 extracts, and obviously quite a few people couldn't get hold of them, which I totally understand. Just use this as a form of inspiration if you can't get hold of them, because we just also wanted to show you about the amazing ingredients that are out there on the market. And there are a lot of suppliers that will ship internationally. So don't hesitate to go and look at some websites outside of your country as well. But anyway, if you can't get hold of them, it's not the end of the world, honestly. But someone says, should I increase the quantity of my essential oils if I can't get hold of CO2 extracts? That depends on the essential oil you are using. So in general, when you create a leave-on facial product, we recommend that you don't go over 1%, maybe one and a half, but I would say 1%. And even that 1% um, is only valid if your um, essential oil, the boom, if there are no <laughs> dermal limits for your essential oils. So for example, um, um, geranium that has a 0.4% dermal limit um, in a facial leave on skincare products. So immediately you can't use 1%. Um, so you need to check what essential oils you have and what the dermal limit is yeah. for, for that. And on that note, someone else asks if CO2 extracts have a dermal limit. And I can't remember your name, I'm sorry, but this person also asked a, about a very specific CO2 extract. We we would need to go and research exact dermal limits. Unfortunately, we don't know them all off the top of our head. Um, but there are some really good resources out there as well. But we can talk about that more in a minute. So first of all, do CO2 extracts have a dermal limit? They probably do, although they are not... Um... <sighs> They are not that black and white um, as we would have with um, with um, essential oils. Um, again, as Lauren said, it's you know we would need to look into it. But if there is a dermal limit, um, your supplier should be able to tell you that. Yes, and that's where I would start. The interesting thing about CO two extraction is it extracts the oil based components from the plant, and some plants will have an essential oil in them, and some plants won't. So for instance, you can get rosehip CO2 extract, which to my knowledge does not have an essential oil in it because rosehip doesn't have an essential oil. But if you um, extracted CO2 from lavender, you would get the essential oil in it because it's part of the plant. So then of course you need to think about the dermal limits of the essential oil, that's part of the CO2 extract. So that does become a little bit complicated. Yeah. But um, like Pi Skincare, who you might've heard of, P-A-I, 
very well-known brand. I don't have it here in front of me. I'm just, <laughs> they're not one of our graduates. Um, they have a rose hip, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, it's a, an amazing serum, but it is mainly based on CO2 extracts. Yeah. Because it but, but, have that dermal limit. That's the thing. So quite often, depending on the, the CO2, like in this case, rose hip, mm -hmm. because rose hip has a carry oil, some, you know, you could, some people regard these kind of CO2s as carry oil, just very pure, because obviously you don't have, um, you know, the, uh, the like with absolutes, you don't use any third compound to, to do the extraction. So that's why CO2s are very pure. Um, ingredients and some people regard it as carrier oil yes so, yeah but yeah Lauren said it's right so if it has essential oil version you would probably get um, you need to pay attention to dermal limit yeah okay <laughs> ah, so many questions right one person asked and I'm sorry I haven't got your names written down because I can't write that fast um, can I infuse more than one herb into an oil Yes, 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 yes. My, one of the best things I did um, was I think I infused five different herbs and I loved it. I loved it. It was just out of curiosity. Um, I wanted to see how it works. I've done the same in water, like tea, and I did the same in carrier oil so I can see the difference because, as you know, you need to know that every single plant will have different compounds, some water soluble some oil soluble so you need to check why do you want that plant to be macerated in the oil what compound what benefit will you have from that plant in an oil base um look at that again One of our graduates. <laughs> yeah so yeah go for it go for it just um you know again just keep notes of every single maceration when you do macerated oil some blogs will tell you fill up a jar, pour the oil on it, and cover it. I, I would say, or we would probably say, at Formula Botanica, that's just not good enough. You need to have your exact amount, whether it's 10% plant, 90% oil, because then you can recreate it again and again and again. Yes, exactly. And it, it really is up to you as well. I mean, as Timmy says, you know, have fun with it. For instance, if you want to use your macerations in different potencies, in different products, you might choose to macerate one plant in multiple am i saying this right you might have to have you might choose to have lots of different macerations with one plant in them or you could go mad and create just like a bouquet of different plants and um you could do the same with glycerites you can do the same with you know decoctions but those would need to be preserved immediately obviously so there are lots of different ways of doing it yeah you could create even a signature blend something that's really yours and you use it in all sorts of um products that has oil so, yeah that's exactly what I wanted to do when I wanted to start my skincare brand before I took over Formula Botanica. You know, I wanted to have a signature blend of different herbs in a glycerite and in an oil. And that would be that would come back in all of my products. So have fun. Be creative. Everyone has plants growing near them that you would be able to use. Exactly. Uh, OK, a question about macerated oils again. How are they written on the label? Um, usually you um, always start, the label always starts with the highest amount. So in this case, you'd start with your carrier oil um, and then you add the plant afterwards. And of course, if you add any antioxidant, that would need to come up. So this is why it's important that when you create your maceration, you write down the formula in percentages and you start with the highest number, which probably would be the carrier oil, then the herb, and then um, the um, antioxidant but again um, if you are in the eu you will get all this information from your safety assessor so in case there's a mistake they will let you know yes problem i'm having now is i have really oily hands and i touch my hair all the time so by the end of this live stream, i'm going to be a <laughs> Okay, uh, we've got a question. We've got a couple of questions from Chima. I've made it to the end of the list, but I have got a few more written down here. So if I haven't addressed your oil-based question yet, I will come to you. Um, who says, when I mix the oils with each other, how can I make them mix with each other when I formulate with oils of a different weight? Because when I do, they remain separate and it shows in the bottle, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, I haven't really seen anything like that happening, um, to be honest. Um, I would probably need to have an example to understand. Yeah. It could happen, and we've seen it happening if somebody uses castor oil 
in a, in a huge amount um and you don't want to go into probably that the, the science a bit in that but yeah if if you want just give us an example because i've never come across where oils don't i have once you, and, you, and what yeah, was that coconut oil really coconut yeah i oil didn't mix with I once received, I can't remember where it came from, and that's probably a good thing because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I once received an oil-based uh, serum and it had coconut oil in it. And because it was cold, the coconut oil in the blend solidified. So there were all these little droplets of sort of half semi-solid coconut oil on the dropper when I took it out of the bottle, which was I didn't think of that one. Suddenly my in my head it was more about the, um, in a minute I tell you, I want to say the word, the, the difference in oil the specific gravity yes <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry yeah so this is what i was thinking about but that's the thing i mean coconut can be um mm -hmm. solid depending on the temperature so you need to be careful um yeah that could it depends happen. it depends i mean for instance i've had avocado oils in the past as well that were completely solid in the bottle because yeah. they were so thick yeah. um and um neem oil does the same you know so it really depends on the oils you're using and you want to make sure that they are they are similar in in um their appearance without going too much into the science at room temperature at the temperature that you're operating in but tell us which oils you worked with and maybe we can have a chat about that um let's see because chima asked another question what's the best preservative for oils there's no such thing um, oils will not require preservative. Uh, there's again a lot of misunderstandings around the around this on the internet. So oils will not need preservatives. What you need is an antioxidant, and the antioxidant will pre pre help prevent the oil from going rancid. So it will increase the shelf life of your oils or oil blend. The two most um, commonly used um, antioxidants would be tocopherol or vitamin E or rosemary extract it can be rosemary co2 or if they say it as rosemary antioxidant um yeah lorraine is having fun again so i you choose either of these we don't normally recommend grapefruit seed extract for this purpose because it's often not pure and you you don't want we we recommend vitamin e even with vitamin e there are many versions you need to check that you are using the natural version. You've got the tocopherol acetate, which is a synthetic version. So you don't want to, probably you don't want to use that unless that's the only thing you can get hold of. Yeah. I was just demonstrating an eye serum produced by one of our graduates in Denmark, Diane, who runs Essentials by Diane J. And earlier, I didn't talk about this. This is a pollution defense serum created by our graduate Koiran in Hong Kong which has sea buckthorn in it, which is why I was dropping it into the bottle. And uh, she's done really well with this, actually. It's really cool. And it's very pretty as well. And it comes a in nice, a nice product. Really cool little packaging container as well. Right, um, so someone else asked, should we keep macerated oils in the fridge? Um, um, while you are macerating or once it's think, done? Once it's done. No, not necessary. Usually, uh, usually your ingredients should be in a cool, dark place. That's the, the general one. Now, many times I've seen people saying you should keep X, Y, Z ingredients in the fridge. Um, in a way, yes. But th the thing is that let's just say you are working, you are in a hot country and you take out your ingredients from the fridge and you start formulating, there will be a huge temperature difference suddenly on that ingredient and then you finish formulating you're putting it back again so even that the giant temperature change is not good for your ingredient so only use the fridge um, if it's really really necessary i would say a simple cool dark place will do the trick yes okay cool uh right I just had a question and I've lost it. Yes, there it is. Uh, two people have asked, I'm looking at Gwendolyn's question here. There was another person earlier about which ingredients they should use for eye serums or anti-aging eye serums, oil-based ones. Do you have any recommendations? Um, not really, to be honest. Um, I would definitely avoid essential oils for eye area or you have to keep it extremely low. But then again, I would say then just, you know, just, just avoid it straight away. Um, 
for some reason for around the eye area i personally prefer water-based products um, and that's because the ingredients i like they would be water-based such as caffeine um so but yeah this is an eye serum yeah so, what does that one have yeah, well i haven't got the box with me i've got it so i've got so many things here i'm sorry <laughs> but this one has green coffee satcha inchi and pomegranate so often having more high performance oils around the eye might be a good idea but as timmy says you want to avoid anything that could irritate the eyes um like essential oils which do have sensitizers and allergens in them um, and some people, a very small percentage of the population, but some people do react to badly to them, which is why we tend to avoid them on the eyes and in very low quantities on the lips. Um, but saying that you could get some really nice high performance oils that could be used around the eyes and that would feel really nice. And I think maybe quick drying oils as well would be a good idea yeah. rather than very greasy ones because no one likes greasy eyes. Especially not if, you, if you're using these in the morning and you want to apply makeup or yeah. you are using contact lenses, it is just gonna smudge um, and create a mess. So for daytime, you'd probably want to go for something like um, dry oils like rose hip or kiwi. They are very nice dry oils. And if, if you want to something for the night, you could go for more nourishing ones. Yeah. When I first um, When I first got started formulating, I used to buy oils and just try them one by one on my face. Um, because you have to get to know your ingredients, right? So I used to have a whole series of um, tester kits that I'd get sent by oil suppliers. And then I'd be like, right, this week is rosehip week. Every night, rosehip would go on my face. Next week is kiwi seed oil week. And so that way, I got to really understand how they felt because I was trying them myself. And with, with carrier oils, not with essential oils, but only with carrier oils, you can put them neat on the skin in most cases. I would avoid neem oil neat and things like that <laughs> but you'll know that yourself because if it if it really stinks you won't want to put it on your face but it's good to experiment and that way you can figure out what works best on your skin and you can get other people to test your blends for you after that as well yeah. also... this is, this is the, the basic things this is one of the first things we teach at formula botanica that you really need to know your ingredients and that's the only way you could create something superb if you understand how they work, what they are like, scent, color, skin feel. So experimenting with whatever you can by itself, like carry oils, go for it. Yep. And I was also just holding up this one, which is a an elixir. It's a, it's a serum um, by one of our graduates called Weiwei, who's here in the UK. Um, and she runs a brand called Bamora, which also has sea buckthorn in it. And you can see, I mean, what an amazing color, right? Very nice. And such a cute bottle. And it doesn't, um, it, with, depending on the usage, it doesn't stain your skin. No. Um, it happened to me, I think, with carrot. Like, oh, no, my, my <laughs> head is all reached. So you do have to be careful with the amount. <laughs> Right, we've had an influx of new questions on serums, so let's keep going. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got a question here. Do we need to stability test our oil-based facial serums? Good Excellent. question. Very good question. And the answer is yes, 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 definitely. You have to stability test everything. So even though, let's just say you are in the EU, it would be um, not compulsory but it's highly recommended. And especially if you want to start selling maybe later and you want to be, um, you want to be selling at retailers um, or, or, you know, um, in, in, in shops, they will ask for official stability testing. So you should always, always test your formulations regardless whether it's got preservatives or not. In this case with oils, it can be like what we talked about before. Let's just say, how does it behave if you live in a cold climate and you're sending it to a hot country or vice versa? So you don't want to end up with a serum that's solidified in your bottle because your oil choice is actually solid in lower temperature. Yep. So this, for example, is a classic example. Always, always need to test your stability, test your product. I'm always really amused when I see our students in hot countries share their photos of coconut oil. <laughs> I'm like, that's not what it looks like here in the UK. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, will, it will make a huge difference. And it also shows you, you know, will the scent change? Will the color change? So if you have a bottle like this, or you have a transparent bottle, will the, the color change? Will the oils change? Does it smell rancid? Yeah. It, it will give you a lot of answers to the testing. So I've got a more advanced question here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Akriti asks about um, 
caprylic capric triglyceride or Lexfield natural, which is isoamyl laurate, isn't it? Um, yes. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. We use it in our hair care course as well for the. Um, the yeah, there's another one, another ester that I always mix it with. The, the uh, silicon alternative as well. Yeah. Um, so she says, can I use, uh, I use these to reduce the greasy feel of my serums. Well, what percentage do you recommend of either? Well, of course, you need to follow the percentage that your supplier sets. But have you ever worked, Timmy, with um, either of those ingredients? I'm holding this one up because it actually has isoamyl laurate and caprylic, cap capric triglyceride in it as well. Yeah, yes. Um, I have to say, and I, I you know, I... For me, it's really maybe just a personal thing. I like using them, especially if I create a product where I want the product to be a bit drier or to have a drier feel. But I also feel they don't give the same goodness as a, a cold-pressed carrier oil would. So yes, you can use it up to 100%. Now the question is, would you or would you mix it um, or would you use it maybe as a balancing ingredient? And yes, Lexfield Natural is not the isomal Oh, is the it? The heptil, heptil under, <laughs> don't ask me, I'll put you dinky. <laughs> but it is like that. Yes, I know that. Um, I can't it's an remember. ester um, from, I think it's from castor oil. So it's a very, very light oil. Um, it, it's up to you how much you use. I like to use it around 5 to 10% in, in um in a in an oil-based serum because it really makes a difference. But I think you could go for a rose hip, kiwi, olive scalding. These are all very nice oil that have a drier feel um, instead yep. or with it. Wow, so many more questions. Um, <laughs> right, I've been holding up all these different serums over the last 50 minutes. And uh, Yas, no, not Yasir, who said it? Christina. Christina, what's the average price for this kind of serum? There isn't an average price. It depends on your brand. Some people might make a serum and charge $150 for it. Other people might make a serum and charge $10 for it. It depends in part on the ingredients you use and on the customer that you're targeting, uh, the type of brand you create, the experience around it all. Um, like we have, uh, I don't know if I have any here. No, I haven't been sent them yet, but one of our graduates is very high priced. In fact, I interviewed her. Um, it's on our YouTube channel, I'll try and remember. What? Jessie, Jessie Ferniel from Adeli Skin. And she has a really high price serum. But then on the other hand, we have our graduates, uh, Elsie and Dominica, who run Bybee in the UK. And these are their little boosters. And these, I think, go for under 20 pounds. And you add these. This is really clever, actually. So this is their CBD booster and they have their Bacuccio booster. And you take your skin cream or your skin serum and you add a couple of drops of your favorite booster to it. Sorry, my hands are really greasy now. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> All the oils I've been playing with. So every night when I use my lotion or my light skin serum, I add in a few drops of one of their boosters. So it's a really clever way of creating a whole new product with just one ingredient in it. I love what they're doing. Um, so yeah, come and, I mean, if you're interested, we run a whole business course on how to start your indie beauty brand. It's like a, an online MBA for indie beauty brands. And it's super in depth, but it will take you by the hand and help you turn your formulation into a business, which is really exciting. Yeah, it's a very, very good course. Uh, we have a few questions about stability testing and people have asked, can we stability test on our own? Absolutely. Stability testing is um, one of those where you have a few, what I would call must-have tests to conduct, and you don't really need to invest in equipment. It's really just time and taking notes, watching how the product behaves. Um, or you have more specialist stability testing, uh, which I really don't think is necessary at this time in the game. That would be probably later on if you if, if you either you have a more specialist product or you are interested in certain scenarios. Um, but yeah, you can do stability testing by yourself. We covered that in our certificate in stability testing course we, where we list 20, 20 different tests that you could conduct. So it all depends on the product. Yeah, I mean, for instance, if you're making a balm or a butter, you'll want to heat test it. 
freeze and thaw test it as well. You know, it really depends on, on what you're making. There are so many different types of tests and we, we run you through all of these in our mini course. Well, it's not a mini course, it's a, a good certificate, but it's it's shorter than our bigger diplomas. Right, uh, I don't even know what to do with all the questions that are still coming in. I've, I've tried to pick out all of the serum and oil-based questions. So if I haven't covered your water-based, oil-based, gel-based, sorry, water-based, emulsion-based, gel-based question, I'm so sorry. Please do go and have a look at the other live streams we did on toners and cleansers because we'll have covered a lot of the questions in there as well, particularly on preservation. Let's see. Um, there was a question about, can I use two to three different oils for maceration for more benefits from the herbs as the oils will then be mixed together? And Ratana uses the examples of rice bran, jojoba and baobab oil. What do you think? Um, I don't see why you shouldn't, but... I mean, why you couldn't, but I'm not sure there you should in a way. Um, I would just pick one, um, one oil, ideally um, some one wheat, which is not too fragile, which is not a fragile oil. Um, we've got the, I think we've got the link up where we show you how to choose the carrier oil for your maceration and just add the other oils as extras. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, try it, see how that works. Yeah, and some oils will have longer shelf lives than other uh, than other oils. So it's also important to think about the shelf life of the oil. But we, again, we have this blog post that tells you exactly what criteria you need to consider when choosing a base oil for your maceration, because it is important to think about that. If you choose a base oil that has a really short shelf life, then it might go rancid quicker than if you choose one that has a high natural vitamin E content, which um, prevents it from going rancid so quickly. All right, let's see. D asks, what's the max recommended time to macerate oils and how much vitamin E should I add to prevent rancidity? Sorry, what was the first question? What is the the time? What do you what's the maximum recommended time to macerate oils? It depends on the method you choose. So there are various methods that people follow. I have seen conversation where herbalists couldn't agree which method was the best. I'm an extremely impatient person and I really don't have time to wait for macerations for a month. So my favorite method is a slow cooker method. So where I have a slow cooker, a little bit of water and I place my jar with the, with the oil and the plant matter and I leave it there for 24, 72 hours, depends, in extremely low heat. So that's why slow cooker is great because it's not gonna burn the house down. Um, and the gentle heat will help with um, with the maceration process. So you see, you see that's the quick version. Other people like to leave the jar on the windowsill out in the sunlight for a month. So there's different methods um, that you can choose. As I said, I'm an impatient one, so I go for the slow cooker version. Yes, fair enough. Because um, someone else asked if sunlight or heating can cause the carrier oils to go rancid when preparing macerations they, they they could and this is where i think there was this um conversation where people couldn't agree i mean with the slow cooker method the, the point is that it's extremely low heat so it's really not high heat you're not i'm not cooking the oils yeah. um second it's not too long so one 24 to 72 hours i mean i usually go for two nights so 48 hours it's not a long time but at the same time, if you have your jar out on under UV, under sunlight, again, that can be just as damaging. So this is where the whole conversation started, that which method is actually yeah. useful or there's not really point. And the thing is, if you're using the long method with sunlight, you have to take the dried plant matter out and replace it regularly with fresh matter. And I have been in herbal workshops where herbalists have brought out big jars with like these big sort of strands of, I don't know Whatever. exactly. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> growing through the water content in the oil. I mean, it looks horrible. And I've often been sat there going, oh my goodness, I can't put this anywhere near my body. So you have to be really careful. And that's why replacing that dried plant matter regularly is really important. So. I'm so sorry if we didn't answer your question. We've answered so many and um, I, I've seen a lot of questions come back. So we haven't repeated them over and over. So if you haven't heard your question answered, if you joined us later on, please do go and catch the first part of the live stream. And if we didn't cover your 
water-based, emulsion-based, <laughs> cleanser-based, toner-based question, please go watch the other two live streams that we've already done as well, because we'll have covered a lot, particularly on preservation in those as well. So we've now come to the end of the course, and I really hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you passed the final test. If you haven't taken it yet, please do go and do it, and you can go and get your certificate of completion. And we've watched so many people already share them on Instagram and share them with us uh, across social media. And I'd love to see yours too. So it's been good fun, hasn't it, Timmy? It has been amazing. And I have to say, I'm so tired. <laughs> Absolutely amazing questions. Thank you ever so much. I really like this because, you know, I often learn with you. Uh, you know, there are chances that maybe I'm not familiar with your question, but then we go and, and research it. So I'm tempted to watch this space, but I'm really tempted to write a blog about CO2 extracts because I think people would love that bit. So come and visit us um, every so often or sign up to our newsletters where we tell you when a new blog post comes out. But I think that's my new project. <laughs> so thank you for your questions. Yeah, exactly. Oh, someone asked, can we link to the previous Q&As? They're in the course. Go and log into your course. Go to lesson one, go to lesson two. They're in there. And we will upload the replay from this video into lesson three after it's done as well. So you'll be able to access it there. Now, I've got some good news for you, which is that the free training hasn't ended. Hooray! I know this mini course has, but we've got another free masterclass for you, which starts on Monday. And we're gearing up for that one now. And what we're going to do in that masterclass is teach you how to turn your formulations into a business. So that is all about becoming an organic skincare entrepreneur like these graduates of ours who've been through our courses. And you might have seen some photos of me already with a whole table full of products in front of me. Those are all made by our graduates and you could do that too. So as of Monday, April 20th, 2020, depending on when you're watching this video, <laughs> we go live with the free masterclass. And you can sign up now at formulabotanica.com forward slash masterclass. And, if, uh, and I'm sure one of our team members can put that link up as well. It's also in your mini course. So when you get to the certificate, there's a big button in there. Click on it and it'll take you straight through. And we've already got, I think, almost 8,000 people signed up for that one too. So we want to get you in there. There's a Facebook group already started. There's over 3,000 people in the Facebook group. It's super busy. So we want you to come and um, work through that material as well. And it'll be taught in a slightly different way. So it won't be on our e-learning platform. Form, and you'll be sent a, a different part of the lesson of the overall masterclass every three days. So the first one comes out on Monday and in that there'll be a video of me and Timmy and we're going to be making a lotion in less than 90 seconds. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, <I remember. laughs> It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun making that. Um, and we'll also yeah. teach you how to define what natural means to you. And there's free worksheets in there. Then we walk you through how to choose the right botanical ingredients for your formulations. Again, you get worksheets and checklists. There's lots of bonus material that we'll be doing in the Facebook group. Timmy and I and Brooke, who you've hopefully also seen, will be live streaming in there as will various other people. We'll be interviewing some graduates. We'll also go deep into natural preservation, like deep. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> I think this masterclass is an excellent addition to the training you've just completed, guys. So especially if you've done all the parts, you're not just like you just you may be just watching us. That that's great. But if you haven't done the free course, go for it because the masterclass is an excellent um, addition to what you've already learned. And you, it's time to fine tune that knowledge a bit. Yeah, exactly. And as we're all on lockdown, we just want to give you the best materials that we have available at the moment to lift you up. And just because you're stuck at home doesn't mean you have to give up on your dreams, right? And that's the most important thing here. So as I said, as of Monday, we go live with the masterclass. Full disclosure, at the end of the masterclass, we do open up enrollment for our International Organic Skincare Entrepreneur Program, which is our big flagship program. And we only open that up twice a year. Um, it contains six of our courses at 30% discount. So we all, we often have this big masterclass to celebrate the fact that we're, we're opening up enrollment. So we want to share this with you. And if you do want to join us, obviously we can take that learning even further. So come and sign up, come and join the free Facebook group. As I said, there'll be loads of bonus training in there. You'll be seeing loads more of me and Timmy and lots of other people from Formula Botanica. And uh, yeah, we really hope that you enjoy it. It's going to be fun.
<laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us live today. Thank you for your excellent questions. Thank you for taking part. And thank you for being just so all round amazing because we love, we love hearing from you and we love teaching and we love sharing all of this. So I hope you have a great week. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>